and we're recording. Okay, so uh, hi everybody. We are now recording, um, and hello from all over the world. People in Texas and Italy and Scotland and England and all over Austria. Perfect. Um, so we're this is a, another virtual behavior chat. We're going to be talking. Uh, this is zoo focused. So uh, I'm not really going to make any elaborate introductions other than to say we have three uh, amazing people here. Uh, uh, Sabrina Brando, uh, Betsy Horelko. Am I saying, do I say your last name correctly? Perfect. I, I well done. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> and Nick Bishop. Uh, uh, and, and Nick and I will hopefully be seeing each other in real life in the not so distant future since we will be working together at Adelaide Zoo uh, once I get over to Australia, which is a whole other thing. But that said, this is kind of open. People can type in questions. I'm gonna shut up now and let uh, these three start talking and I'll jump in every now and then, but let's take it from there. <laughs> Did I just open that up in way too open of a... A lovely pause of politeness there while we all graciously <laughs> defer to each other. <laughs> so who's going first? For me, one of the most uh, beautiful aspects for me to focus on, perhaps to get the zoo context ball rolling, was the idea of positive animal visitor interactions in the zoo. To give you a bit of background for me on the Animal Behaviour and Creative Programs Manager at Zoo South Australia. And we look after two really different sites. We have a city zoo, which is eight hectares small. And we have then a open range safari park, Monato Safari Park, which is 1600 hectares. It's huge. So you can imagine the diversity of the behaviour applications happening in that space. I mean, when you've got a lion home area, in a free, you know, it's Fari Park space that can contain the whole of the city zoo. That makes for some pretty radical variations in how we manage a lot of our interactions. Of course, well, we're driven very much by the desire to connect people with nature. And of course, then as a corollary of that, save species from extinction. And of course, one of the ways we do that is with brief animal encounters and behind the scenes interactions. One of the joys of my recent job has been to develop an animal visitor interaction survey, which is a welfare based document that helps us assess through every phase of the interaction process. As much as possible, the levels of well being and welfare that are going on for animals in that space. It's been an amazing process in drilling down to those interactions and especially looking at what humanimals do in those spaces and humanimal behavior and how it influences animal behavior. So that's one of our big moves to get the positive animal visitor interactions in the zoo going. And I wondered if Sabrina and Betsy had any models like that, that they've been working with as well. Mm. Um, good question. So I'm Betsy Horelko. I'm the Animal Welfare and Research Manager at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute in Washington, D.C. And we uh, are we're very fascinated and invested in those positive mm. visitor and just human interactions. And we have not uh, started studying that one yet. So that's certainly something of interest. Um, so I'd be curious to see what Sabrina hears or, or has seen in her around the world work in welfare. But I would also like to pose a question. I'm curious if you can talk about this, Nick, perhaps in a little bit about how, if you're open during the pandemic, how that's changed in relation to the protocols that you guys have, I'm sure have implemented. But first, maybe we can go to Sabrina. <laughs> yes, so hello, my name is Sabrina Brando and I'm the director of Animal Concepts. And um, yes, well, I haven't, you know, studied human animal interactions more than only on dolphins. So we, and very specifically there, we looked at um, swim programs. So whether the animals enjoyed being, you know, in these swim programs and, um, and which parts of the swim programs they enjoyed. 
or, you know, and looking at the specifically of the pre and the post sessions. And with regards to those interactions, what we actually found in, in dolphins uh, in a park in Curacao was that they really, you know, were kind of indifferent to, to these programs, which is, I think, very important finding in the sense that especially animals that are engaged in all kinds of programs like, you know, interactive programs. Um, if we're talking about, you know, positive well-being and, you know, finding engagement and choice and control, they, they participate in the programs, but they don't really seem to, you know, sway one way or the other. And if you're doing, you know, three or five or six of those a day, then I think, you know, we would want that that is something that is truly positive for them. It's not like, yeah, I'm doing it, but I really couldn't care one way or the other. So obviously it needs a lot more study, but uh, I found that really intri intriguing uh, together with my co-authors. And what we actually found was there was a lot more interest in just interacting with the trainers outside of the sessions on, on areas where there was a lot of people. So, and those things seem to be, and that's not surprising to many of you working with animals, that those seem to be a lot more interesting and uh, probably because it's maybe very much more varied or there could be various reasons closer to the fish kitchen, closer to, you know, mm -hmm. all activities, but the programs itself, you know, wasn't really one way or another. So that's, that's the only research I've done in that field. But in the 24 seven across lifespan approach, uh, we, have a, we have a workshop developed around that. And, um, and it's actually not a welfare assessment. It's more like an awareness creation tool where uh, a section of that is specific about the human animal interaction. And in, actually in the workshop, we, the whole idea is to look at, you know, obviously how do animals live in the wild and what are their dispositions perhaps or their you know likelihoods of interacting with people which is for most animals zero uh, or depending you know where they live could be a little bit more but in general and then we look at how um, you know what type of interactions or what is the frequency of the interactions are these ha animals having depending on where they live um, and really setting that in a context of you know <clears throat> thinking of enrichment and training and so on and care in general. So that's that's pretty much the work that we've done in our bubble. Yeah, I so, think, uh, sorry, oh, go on. Oh yeah, I was just gonna take a step back real quick and just say, um, so this this concept of animal visitor interactions in, in zoos and aquariums um, is part of, so what's called AVIs, is part of a larger what you're hearing, um, I think everybody's referred to human animal interactions, which I think is a more popular, you know, that's the broader field. Um, in zoos, we call them animal visitor interactions, right? But human animal interactions or HAIs um, are, uh, have been studied um, in zoos. It's, we've got a couple decades under our belt with animal visitor interactions. Um, outside of that, you know, of course, people have studied human animal bond, which is a lot more popular to talk about it that way for human animal interactions with companion animals. And then farm, uh, it, it, they've, they've uh, done a bunch of research too. But so we're talking about two different components here, which is both um, the larger theoretical philosophical framework, and then also the research. And so uh, that said, I just wanted to give some context to this bigger area. And this includes things like animal assisted therapies outside of zoo world. Um, that's often you'll see a lot of human animal interactions talked about in that way. Anthrozoology is largely focused on human animal interactions. I like to say that every time, everything that involves an animal and you is a human animal interaction. Um, but that said in zoos, so our animal visitor interactions has been the primary focus. And most of the research on this topic has been about how visitors affect animals. Almost, um, in fact, the vast majority of it is, is it, and, and a lot of it is, is looking at, well, is it detrimental um, to the welfare of the animal, how the visitors act? You know, large crowds, loud crowds, things like that. That's typically what's been studied. What's becoming more popular now, and we have a special issue of animal behavior and cognition 
um, dedicated to animal visitor interactions. Uh, Sam Chu and I, uh, Sam Chu out at University of Melbourne and who's done her research with little penguins out at Melbourne Zoo. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both the guest editors on that. Nick knows yes. Sam very well. Um, so, and I'm gonna, I, I'm telling myself in my own brain here right now to shut up in a second, but I just wanted to provide some overall context. Um, so um, that said, um, there, where I'm trying to get a lot more research focused on what the visitor experience is because that's important. But then also, this aspect of positive animal visitor interactions. In many cases, we have done we've done more to mitigate the potential problems that that animals suffer from in terms of their welfare from having visitors too close or things like that. And I, I love to talk about positive animal visitor interactions because I think we can increase uh, interactions in a way that is beneficial for the welfare of the animals and the visitors, right? So we're talking about positive uh, visitor experience and animal uh, uh, and, and, and benefits to the welfare of the animal. And some of those include things like public feedings, um, so uh, uh, public training sessions, shows, which have uh, that in and of itself. So all of that said, that's part of, uh, and, and by the way, everybody can type questions at any point and I'm gonna shut up now. So let me know. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, Sabrina. Go for it. Oh, I, I just wanted to add in, I think as you were talking about, we often focus on the negatives and how can we mitigate risk that yeah. it, it just rings true through the entire concept of animal welfare and everything that we've done for decades and how we're right. trying to transfer it into focusing on positives and how can we increase and improve. So we've been are, are kind of working with meeting people where they are. And so mm -hmm. this is an interesting thing to think about within visitors the more examples you gave, the more as a practitioner, I think like, oh God, that and that and that, and how do we make that happen? And messaging, 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 messaging is what's like stinging out in my head of how do we make sure people understand what this is and come on our journey and don't leave thinking, I would love to have a penguin at home or, yes. or wh right. whatever that is. Um, why can't I pet that, that sort of a thing? So it's, it's a hard I think journey to figure out what's right for your zoo. So it's great to think about models, um, models that are out there that are doing it well. Yeah, and I'm just going to throw in on top of that. That's been part of why we've tended to try to 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 reduce or mitigate or con or uh, vastly control the the visitor interactions they have with animals in zoos is because our our fear. Um, uh, although often not empirically tested, but our, uh, the fear of many zoos has been that it's going to uh, decrease the conservation understanding, the proper education of the experience that visitors should have with those animals in many cases. So we don't want people necessarily directly interacting with this endangered or wild species because then they may leave the zoo and do that. So um, it's, it's an, an interesting concept because there's more going into how is that affected now uh, in ter like, what is that visitor experience? Because we know so little empirically about the visitor experience. Um, and there's a recent paper by De Cruz et al. that talks about what's happening around the world. Um, De Cruz et al., 2019, um, uh, Neil De Cruz, uh, and the, they look at what uh, interactions are available, both direct and indirect, at zoos around the world. Um, and it turns out there's probably a lot more interactions that we're, we're necessarily accounting for because we often, you know, there's a lot of potential experiences people can have. So it's a really interesting study because now we know at least that there are a lot of possible interactions that we are allowing. So now what do we do to measure what effect that has? So anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nick, go for it. So much fantastic and fascinating material rising in this space for me um just collecting a few notes i've got my laptop just littered with little post-its here so just work with me on this one but one of the things that i grabbed was when eduardo mentioned the idea of bond and 
I think in my interactions with people who have intense uh, relationships with um, domestic animals, the idea of bond is a thing that needs to be operationalized. We need to actually know more about how bond is understood by human animals and what that looks like as interactive behavior. And so that's something that I encourage strongly with the trainers with whom I work in the zoo industry. And I remember too that Valda Stellard, a great friend of mine uh, who works at Columbus Zoo and Aquarium said to me once, you know that you're getting a relationship going with the animal and that you may well be moving into an improved welfare state. And this is based on inference just by observing the conduit of behavior. That's all we have to go on because effective state is of course the animal's covert business. But he said something really pithy and gorgeous. And I love things that just sum up the essence of the matter. And he said, for me, it happens when the animal stops looking at you and starts looking for you. When you see some kind of seeking behavior going on in that relationship. And I started thinking then about how we get human animals to seek in the context that Betsy was talking about just then in terms of messaging, such a cool point that Betsy raised. And we're working on messaging at the moment because my other job is be creative programs manager. So I work with the art of story. I'm passionately interested in behavior, but I have a huge history in performance arts and theater and storytelling. And one of the areas of research in recent years is how brains respond to storytelling. So I think that there is a really important role that human animal storytellers play here. This gorgeous thing called neural pairing that all of us experience when we're watching theater or film and we begin to move into the emotional space of the protagonist or the actors. And we begin to identify with what they're doing. And that identification ability, that neural pairing of being able to move symp sympathetically, if not empathically into that space is a really fascinating area for me that I'm tinkering with in this visitor animal interaction. Content. So I'm fascinated to continue to, to tinker with that. I'm just on the verge of looking at stabilizing messaging across our keeper talks. And a lot of that's going to be based on how we can get the human animal to identify with the animal plight in a way that they can see themselves joining the cause to support that species. And I like to call it to enlist the listener, to enlist the listener into that space. It's very early little tinkering I have with that right now. But that helps me, I think, set up a platform for answering more of those questions that Eddie was alluding to about, hang on, we spent a lot of time looking at the animal experience, but what's the human animal experience? And if we can set up some really clear, creative, as well as practical tools to do that, it could be a really worthwhile area of investigation. Because one of the great things we have about the human animals that have those experiences is that they can actually tell us what's going on for them. We can have those discussions, those conversations. So that's just a, a little bit of stuff in the mix here, trying to draw together these diverse and, and exciting threads that have been put into the conversational space today. In, uh, I don't, I don't want to generalize and say in U.S. zoos, but in U.S. zoos, that conversation has been revolving around uh, empathy and compassion and building empathy, building empathy and using that as the basis of our education programs and how we build our storytelling and connections. So it's interesting to hear how different folks talk about those concepts. Yeah, indeed. And I think that for me, the, um, the major thing that we would like to help people explore is that we are more similar than we are different and that we share a existence here on this resource-based planet where we are all united. Doesn't matter if you're a tardigrade or a tiger or a blue whale or a bullfinch, you're all moving towards a reinforcement of some sort. Oh, yeah. And that a resource-based planet is a concept I'm finding people really understand. And it's really cool 
too, to start doing some of that modeling that Eddie was referring to about um, training sessions within the context of a interaction. And I like to think of our zoo being a mothership that sends out lots of little satellites of improved welfare awareness in terms of application ability in domestic settings as well. If you come to us, I want you to have an experience that gives you some material that you can use to meaningfully develop better welfare practices on your home base as well. So there's that, that potential in that space, which we really enjoy. And indeed the last few weeks at Adelaide Zoo, we've been doing a bird show that is completely about how we train behavior and how we develop cooperation with our avian co-workers. And that's how we refer to them, our colleagues, the animals that work with us, knowing that they didn't ask to be there. And as Terry Ryan says, honor thy chicken. He didn't ask to be there. And so we use that basis. And the whole show has just been completely founded on demonstrating those principles so that and we highlight and we say directly these are concepts that you can use at home with dogs cats rabbits guinea pigs other human animals believe it or not so there's uh, an amazing there's been a quite an enthusiastic take up of that through those those demos and all wonderfully fluid and experimental at this stage as well uh, I know Sabrina's been waiting to say something I was just going to say we got a couple uh, questions comments um, so we feel free to like, everybody can type in any questions, comments, and, uh, Sabrina, I'm not, I'm going to shut up so you can talk. Oh, Sabrina, that's like, absolutely fine. Like, uh, I was yeah. just, um, thinking about, you know, the, um, when we're talking about human animal interactions, like from the broadest angle, not just visitors, but just, um, to me, it's also, I, I look at it at anything that is also not actually directly interacting. So the conscious decision not to interact, the, the, our beliefs, uh, the way that we talk and make decisions, the things that we don't do. Uh, so we're not interacting because of a particular decision or a particular belief. And, and to be aware of what that might mean for the animals. Um, so I don't know whether that's helpful, but you know that's kind of zooming it way out. But to me, it seems um, really important to consider that as much as what does it you know mean? Was it was the animals experience directly when they are viewing, interacting with us, co-working with us? Um, but also, what is the experiences of the animal because of our decisions uh, of, for example, not to interact or, you know, how the way that we talk, what words we use when we speak about them um, or about, you know, the greater community of life or the planet in general. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, that's a really important part of the operational definition too, because that's something other people have attempted to address in some way. And that's why I talk about direct and indirect interactions, but I consider, you know, like I, I had previously mentioned, hu human animal interactions, if we're talking about the animal, if there's an animal that we can see or an animal can see us, that's an interaction at that point. It's all of that, right? So these are, I would just say those are indirect interactions, but they're absolutely important to remember also whether, and I say see, because now I'm talking about us, and I don't mean to be so anthropomorphic and anthropocentric, but, you know, for many animals, I mean, if it's a polar bear, it's, you know, somebody mm -hmm. showed up 20 miles uh, in front of the, the zoo and happened to have some really strong uh, cologne or perfume. Um, that may, that involves a potential uh, uh, animal visitor interaction for that polar bear. So, um, but it's not just those direct interactions. I mean, it's all of that. It's it, so that said, uh, there was a question about. Sorry, sorry. I, I I would say that what what I was trying to say actually goes one step further, which yeah. is really you know a, a philosophy. It's a a way of thinking or working that um, is you know not necessarily 
indirect or direct, but I mean, it's indirect, but very far away. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, um, I think it's going to be key. So, you know, the decisions that we, for example, make uh, for animals, they, they, we are not directly in contact with them, it's, but it affects right. them. Uh, right. So that is, that is what I meant with even yeah. if, you know, even in our decision making sphere, our philosophy or religion, whatever else in that sphere way out, um, it's, it's still a, a sort of an effect that it could have and to be aware of that. Yeah, that that, that kind of gets to, I think, because uh, there was a question about connectedness to yeah. here. That's uh, a good one from uh, yeah. Joanna Shelton. Hi, Joanna. You are you have a potential answer, Nick? No, no, I, I have a potential cure. Well, I had an absolute curiosity in that, and I was keen to put that to you, Eduardo. Is there a measure of animal connectedness equivalent to nature connectedness? I I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I am I am not very familiar, uh, even uh, uh, you know, with the concept of uh, nature connectedness aside from. Um, you know, more specific education and experience uh, definitions of these concepts, you know, how it relates to conservation. Um, so I don't, I don't know how animal connectedness is necessarily being defined. Um, so I, I should say this, in animal visitor interactions in zoos, there are usually some very, I mentioned direct and indirect interactions. And so it's, it's, taken in very categorical ways. And part of that um, is based on, you know, what's the visitor experience and the visitor experience is measured directly through um, uh, their behaviors, things like crowd size, um, uh, length of stay in front of the exhibit, um, and then uh, how they respond to surveys. So that's visitor experience. And then the animal uh, side of that is usually measured through a bunch of welfare measures. And as uh, both Betsy and I have talked about, that's often examined through, okay, did this um, negatively impact the welfare of the animals? Although now we're starting to look at a lot more of the positive effects. And in fact, uh, a paper I have under review with zoo biology right now looks at uh, one of the first uh, studies that demonstrates uh, positive welfare benefits from public feeding, a public feeding event with elephants at Woodland Park Zoo, uh, study that we did a number of years ago. So anyway, that's all I know about this. Uh, Sabrina or Betsy may know more. Go for it, yeah. Sabrina, because we might be talking about the same chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm not. So you go for that oh, one. Uh, no, one I... <laughs> that, uh, that came for me to mind when I was reading um, Joanna's uh, question. I, for me, it, um, I, I kind of put it together in the sense, and I'm, I may be going in a different direction than you were thinking, but I was thinking about, you know, not uh, uh, humans being connected to other animals and to nature. Uh, animals being nature and so on. And so I had to think about, you know, how we have um, totem animals or we have stories like, you know, Nick is talking a lot about storytelling, but there's just so many ways, uh, even in my, um, you know, in Dutch Italian, there's just so many ways that we connect to animals through stories, through sayings, through the ways that we, um, you know, worship them or interact with them, not even directly, but just what they mean to us in the, on a spiritual level um, and why, you know, uh, some of us at least are very much um, connected and, and motivated to protect animals. And so when I was thinking about connectedness in there, I was really thinking about that kind of string, um, and I guess, and sort of invisible string that we have to other animals and to to nature and um, and why we're often so compelled. So I had to think more in that sphere. So not necessarily in the science of, of animal connected, but how important other animals are um, throughout, you know, in our myths and everything else. Mm -hmm. Our entire umwelt, exactly. Yeah. Um, like pulling kind of from that a little bit and also thinking about what Eddie was saying with um, looking at the physio, maybe it was a physiological changes after an animal encounter. Um, Sabrina and I wrote a chapter 
that is sometimes hard to remember because it was so long ago, but is still coming out thinking about connectedness and connecting to uh, animals and zoos and aquariums. So like thinking about wild animals in the city. So outside of their natural habitats where they are either in an urban environments or in, in captivity. And uh, we draw on some of these concepts of the very small literature there is in thinking about connectedness to nature and how that impacts you directly as a human and um, the studies that have happened in that concept. And then the very small bucket of literature thinking about how animals impact humans in that way. So that's how I'm thinking about Joanna's question there. Uh, but I do wanna tie back to, sorry, thinking about the whole overall concept that Nick was talking about with um, finding common links to animals. And it seems like they have a general theme of respect in their training program, just respect across the board. And also layering in the importance of understanding those different perspectives that Sabrina and Eddie were talking about a little bit of, we are similar, but, and those are helpful to build those bonds, but to also respect just as much those different perspectives that they bring to the table and how they experience the world. Because we, as much as we love studying animals and animal behavior and animal welfare, when we come up with questions that are, that are important to us in the animal welfare world, we so often end up talking about how humans perceive everything. And right. we end up, and then we haven't really launched into that huge portion of conservation psychology that I think is really booming on the horizon. So I'm excited to see where, where that goes next. Yeah, there, there's a, a oh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna let, I think Sabrina had something she was gonna say, so I'm gonna let, <laughs> oh, uh, am I shutting up without the Okay, I thought I was shut. I, I, okay, well, I, I was just going to add in this little component of what I was going to say. I'm often, I'm the, the, I'm the nerd in the room that shows up and ends up uh, ruining so much of this conversation because I start bringing the science, like I'm always looking for ways that I can measure these things. How do I measure this? How do we, how do we measure these components? So I'm kind of the party pooper in that respect. Because the second I hear something about connectedness, okay, how am I going to operationally define that so that we can measure that? Um, so, and I, I, I can only imagine the amount of times, right? There, there's Sabrina. I was waiting for your hand to come up, Sabrina. And so I was like, the amount of times that I ruin conversations for Sabrina because we're having some discussion about the relevance of this. And I'm immediately saying, Sabrina, how are we going to measure that? How are we going to, what are we going to do there? What are, you know, Sabrina's way too familiar with this experience with me already of, of just uh, being the, the Debbie Downer on, on this, in this, uh, uh, conversation. Um, but that said, I do want to say there's some really interesting things that have been done recently um, for looking at some of these interactions with taking qualitative behavior assessments. Um, now, we're talking about taking qualitative uh, inputs through Likert scales and turning those in, and because we're using a Likert scale now, turning that, in, turning that into quantitative data. But uh, Isabella Clegg and Delfour et al. have looked at some of these things. Uh, Delfour, I don't know, that was 2020. Um, mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, how some of the first measures of showing positive welfare experiences through uh, dolphin shows across, I believe, European zoos is what mm -hmm. Delfour was looking at. Um, Delfour et al. 2020. Um, and uh, and showing that these dolphins were seeking the interactions with the people that they were uh, that that were that they were involved in these shows with. So that's another interesting way that this is measured: these interactions and potential positive interactions. So, all right, Sabrina, now you have stuff you. <laughs> well, I think you know um, I'm a trained psychologist. Um, I like data. I like science. But I'm also very much trying to think about experiences, about beliefs, about connections, about emotions, about how people are in this world and what is true to them, uh, whether that is. And so for me, the conversations that I have with my friends who study oral history and they comment things in such a different way than we do when I say we like, you know, wanting data and how can we measure it 
um, it's so different and and really you know over time learning about different types of research methods and uh, look you know perceptions I think it's really important to try obviously we want to have some evidence-based decision making where we can but at the same time I think it's as important to stay very very open to other if you like lines of investigation, lines of experiencing and being in this world that have different languages, that have different words, that have different approaches that we are not necessarily maybe, you know, doing in the same way as it is in biology or in, in physics. And so to really, you know, give hold space for other ways of knowing and, um, and experience and to talk about that and then finding out. Uh, and I think to be very mindful of the fact that we have to be careful not to say that certain methods are always going to be trumping or mo more important than other ways of measuring or experiencing. Uh, and I guess this is where, you know, I when I go, what some people would say fuzzy, or when you go, mm. you know, mm, this is where I'm trying to be um, yeah, just to hold space for, for difference, um, of, yeah, that's it really. Yeah. I, I think that's important too, because when, when you mentioned about knowing and I, I'm, uh, that's a really relevant component to how we know, I'm always looking for the way that we can turn this into quantitative data. Um, for mm -hmm. me, the science of welfare requires some level of measurement direct quantitative measurement. Um, that's how mm -hmm. I'm going, that's, that's how I need to, to, to convince people that we do know something about the animal experience and the visitor experience. Um, because I mm -hmm. keep making this argument about the visitor experience and how important that is um, for zoos. But so um, to me, there's- And I agree with that, you know, yeah. I think it's yeah, important yeah. and I know that you and I agree that it's the study yeah. of one. Right, so it's the truth for one, for whatever it is that we find uh, yeah. and try to find. Um, so yeah, I don't think you're a party pooper at all. Uh, but I think you know sometimes yeah. we we have to you know deliberately like when I speak to people who are some of my friends who study oral history and they're coding the individual experience of people writing letters to to others and looking right. at the well being of the person at that moment of writing the letter because they come from such, they are, you know, when I try to explain how we, for example, try and understand welfare, they, they think that's different, right? So, and so I think it's so interesting to learn about how do different fields look at what well-being means and how do we quantify it and try and understand, you know, um, the, what you don't say or why, why is there a pause here or right and so and this is what we're trying to measure and I think it's so interesting to look across uh, yeah let's see yeah and building on that I completely agree that it's so important to hold that space and to make a point to work on that it is exhausting to try to like step into someone else's shoes and understand the language of their science or their art or whatever it might be but um, in hearing you both speak about that it it reminded me about how it is so important because even though I might be more inclined with, with Eddie to think about the data and really push forward for that, when I'm asking our keepers to transfer everything that they do into an animal assessment program that is focused on quantifying something or, or scoring it in some capacity, I'm asking them to speak my language. And that is a really big ask and kind of helping people go along that journey. So it, it's interesting to hear about these different perspectives because sometimes it's so easy to forget that my perspective is, even though it might be the best one, according to me, it's different for someone else. So how can I, how can I meet folks where they are and build that buy-in to go on the, the program journey I would like to go on? And Betsy, that's raising a really fantastic point that I really echo, want to echo here, and I really identify with what you're saying, because one of my jobs is to work with diverse teams across diverse groups of animals and to try and find a way to make it as easy as possible for the busy keeper day, because there are, there's so much activity in the keeper day 
to make it as easy as possible for them to interact with me in that space and to design pro forma that allow them to readily and swiftly update information and give me material is at least that's what I think you're saying Betsy mm -hmm. yeah that's for me also a area of passion and a real pursuit at the moment is to tinker with that and also given that we all occur in our antecedents and we're all behaving and we're all very prone to consequences and the way they influence our internal states and therefore drive our decision processes and therefore influence our next set of interactions. One of the things that I've been trialing, at least at the free flight at Adelaide Zoo, is a poster that I made in collaboration with Susan Friedman that just lists a set of really simple ideas about interacting with behaviour so that we take some responsibility for massaging the antecedent feeling of the space. If I can be so fuzzy, Sabrina, um, I'm a fuzzy kind of guy and that I'm very interested in intersectionality as you've been all getting into that area of looking at the intersectionality of it. And I'm, I'm interested in setting tones and atmospheres and helping to predispose mindsets that bring people into a extra notch or extra couple of levels of effectiveness with their animal interactions. And so if I want to get some information from them, I'm hoping that all of that relationship building and all of that tone setting is moving us in the direction of predisposing readiness to continue to interact with us. Because seriously, there are some amazing languages I've found that other that keepers are speaking from their individual experience. And the thing that we have to remember is that this stuff works for them. This They've had a lifetime, many of them, of being in zoos and seeing what they're doing working for them. And this is the thing that's really hard to get to, I think, when, and it spills over into the animal visitor interaction space as well. When you're looking at human animals, visitors in that space is how do you actually get the individual subjective experience meaningfully into that space at that moment? And so to try and bring all of those diverse streams, all those separate understandings and plat them, those threads, plat them together into one strong thread of intention when we're starting to look at this stuff is for me an area that I'm really enjoying tinkering with at the moment. And that's why I'm looking so forward to Eddie being in Adelaide on my patch because we'll be able to... I think experiment with that and I'm looking forward to the learning and development that I'll do as a result of that. I, I mean, Nick, I, I, I am very excited to get to work with you, but in all honesty, I'm, I'm more excited to hang out with the Quakas. You know, I didn't want to ruin that for you, but um, no, I'm actually, I, I can't stress enough how um, super excited I am to, in fact, uh, we have an honor student, um, Susan Hazel uh, and I are, are supervising an honor student that's going to be working with Nick and just having that virtual interaction with working on a project has already um, got me super excited. So I, I'm really looking forward to the stuff that Nick and I get to come up with uh, once we get me to Australia, which was supposed to have happened a year ago, um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, um, if we can get you know, into the bromance bag here, a little bromance that started with that tantalizing first visit when you were there, I was so excited to spend time in that space, and then you were so savagely whisked away from me by the vagaries <laughs> of the mutant hedgehog that is COVID, so, uh, yeah, it's going to right. be pretty amazing. Um, so there, there we go. Let's have another bit again, shall we? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's 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 going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to when we we do get to uh, uh, work together on some of these projects because we have we have goat projects that we're both passionate about. Uh, we have quakas. Um, there's a lot of stuff. So. Um, all right, so uh, that said, I'm sitting here trying to look at some questions and comments and just redirecting here. Um, it, 
So I know there was some, uh, so uh, Zuzo was asking about conservation and appropriate interactions, um, the, the difference between adults and children. And there's mm -hmm. been some, again, there's been far less of a focus in uh, when looking at animal visitor interactions on the visitor experience, but there's some really cool stuff. And Nick, you would love this, this paper. I'm gonna have to send this to you because um, it was a few years ago, Spooner et al. Um, looked at the effects of theater and conservation messaging on adults and children. Um, so they were looking at, uh, as their dependent variables, differences between kids and adults. And I think when that's fairly common um, to, to start to look at some of those differences about both what the experience is what the experience is for the adult and the kid. I think where zoos um, can learn a lot more from is from museology and, and, and uh, the study of museums. And it, because museums have the luxury, not having quote unquote live collections of getting to focus on the visitor experience when it comes to visitors in this sense. So they look at, you know, when, they're, when they look at a, a visitor immersed in, in an exhibit, um, or around an exhibit, um, they don't have to worry about how that piece of art or uh, that, you know, those hieroglyphs or, or whatever it feel about the visitors, right? They can focus exclusively on the visitor's experience in that, uh, in that interaction, in that exhibit interaction. Uh, so they've done a lot of really amazing things that way, but Spooner et al. has been one of the studies that looked at the effects of theater um, so, you know, people with puppets um, and uh, a flamingo puppet and something else, um, and then people dressed up as meerkats, and they did some fun little songs that they were doing of like, all about that base, but instead it was about flamingos eating shrimp, so all about that shrimp, um, et cetera, et cetera, fun stuff like that, and they, they, they looked at how uh, that it affected kids versus adults, and I think that's really important. Um, to look at some of those differences, especially in terms of conservation message. I should say um, there are people that have also looked at the difference between conservation education and conservation action, which is really incredibly important. Um, and it turns out they don't match necessarily all that well. So this we can't assume that just educating people about conservation at the zoo is going to result in them taking more action. So there's a few papers by uh, uh, Moss and Jensen that examine these aspects. So um, that's also important. Um, I know Chris uh, was asking about animal affinity. Um, Ooh, before we get into animal affinity and moving on, I think what, so I, I think, uh, and I'm, I have met you before and I'm so lovely about your comments and I'm so sorry, I'm constantly worried I'm going to say your name wrong. So, um, Zuza, Zuza, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I, I think it, the, and she, as she clarified it a little bit, so she wants to take that concept even further and think about not just those differences between children and adults, but what does everybody bring in terms of their point of visiting? And, and why are they there? And are they there for fun? Are they there for education? Are they there to get away because they don't have anything else to do with their kids? And what does that perspective bring? And does that, is that a barrier for people learning? Is it helpful? There's so many different, there's such just this other really deep layer to help us untangle those interactions and that understanding of what people take home from a zoo visit. And I'm sure that that doesn't even give um, the full consideration to the things that she's thinking about. I, I really love that Zusa's asking that question. So thank you. Is it uh, Zusa Lugosi? Close, she says. <laughs> so for me, what I've found is that very often, if adults are there with children, then they will travel through the ch child's experience. I see a high level, just anecdotally, of identification with the child's experience from the adults. So one of those key points for shaping experiences for me, especially in the areas that Eddie and I have been alluding to about interaction with domestics and indeed natives like quokkas, is that if the child is engaged and having an experience that they are finding manifestly worthwhile, and a great thing is that children so often 
are not filtering like adults are, that their evident experiential state is so surface that I find that highly reinforcing, but just by observing adults, I love watching adults around children engaging with an element of interest that we've set up and that can take any form, but it usually has some kind of animal centric aspect that once you've got the child, so often for me, my experience, you've also got the grown up as well. And so often we find that if children are there, that conduit to the adult is for us a really handy way just to get some concepts into that space as well. And it harks back to that concept I introduced earlier to enlist the listener, to put that idea forward. And I'm not necessarily going for a massive conservation comprehension and as a corollary of that, an action. I think that there's a strong case for saying that conservation awareness can grow from a place of understanding your one-to-one interaction in that space that you can then take to your animal at home and that becoming more understanding just about your interactions with those nearest and dearest to you is a beginning point for that and if we are also talking about data and the desire to measure then eddie I would be so thrilled to work on that. Imagine just testing the community response to that. And if we could find a way to see how the zoo visit influenced people's behavior with their animals at home, that would be pretty amazing. So for me, it's definitely about engaging the child and the adult will usually follow in that space because we're all prone to our environment. We're all prone to the signals, to the stimuli we're receiving and Usually adults who have children there are very, very invested. But then there's also that commonality point that I think Betsy's alluding to as well. What's the, what are the common points that we can be pretty sure absolutely everybody is going to find interesting and appealing? And that's another whole area of investigation for me as well. A great curiosity focus too. Yeah, I, I just met Case. Uh, uh, so Case Casey, I will. Uh, I'm I'm happy to share any references um, that I've mentioned. Um, I have plenty of lists, and I'm very grateful. Um, by the way, as I'm sitting here trying to multitask, that I've got uh, Betsy and Nick and Sabrina here to to help uh, uh, deal with the nuances of the questions that I'm butchering occasionally here and trying to answer as I sift through multiple uh, questions. So this is very, uh, it's very nice. Um, I know I was, yeah, go ahead, Sabrina. Yeah, sorry, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, as you as uh, you both, uh, Betsy and, and Nick, as you were talking, um, I got this sense of playfulness come over me, where I was like, you know, like this kind of case, uh, case you refer to the emotionality, you know, our emotional connection to animals. And this whole, like when you are an adult, uh, often, you know, we forget uh, to play and we have to deliberately play more. And then when we find each other, I don't know if this is true, but, uh, you know, I just wondered, I don't have any children myself, but I know that when I am around children, it's almost this, you know, <laughs> free card to be a kid again. And uh, I can, you know, move in that space of playfulness, of emotional and, and out of the cerebral thinking, connecting, messaging, all that stuff so and I wonder now what sort of research would revolve around that space where it's about connecting to other animals our planet greater community of life from the heart from our emotions uh, and then of course measuring it I'm not saying don't measure it but uh, just this whole space of how we get change uh, through our emotional connections without necessarily having to have words or messages to describe so and uh, and that whole you know in what way are we going to set up some of these activities some of these this research that revolves around uh, being uh, like this embodied uh, way um, without necessarily having that 
cognitive frame around it only. Let's say that. Stop there. We're going to have to team up with some social scientists mm -hmm. um, right. to bring that element in for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's fun to dabble in, but we need to acknowledge that that's not our playground necessarily. We need yeah. to bring in another sandbox. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a really good point, Betsy. And, and that's a really worthwhile endeavor. Let's bring it on. I, I love that. If the social scientists can actually help us investigate that space, if we have a hunch that something's going on there, and we need some better and, ref and more refined, more specialist tools to actually really drill down and see what's occurring in that space, then I say, let's do that. What a collaboration. Great suggestion. Yeah. It also, uh, thinking about play and, and like you talked about tone setting, uh, some of the books on play that I've been reading that are m mainly actually on, on human play and the the learning or the types of behaviors that are shown depending on what is the theme of a playground or what is the setup of a particular theater, if you like, or space and the behaviors that are triggered or the conversations or, you know, the type of play that is triggered just depending on space. Like yeah. it's so interesting to think about all these things being connected when we're trying to stage something uh, that is going to help um, convey our conservation messaging or anything else and uh, and how do we do that sort of tone setting but at the same time also having space uh, because the tone setting can also be the block for entering right because it might not be the space you want to play in or learn in so uh, and how much do we know about that to um, connect with all kinds of people um, small and, and big so I love that about like the tone setting can be a block to what's happening. And that reminds me of thinking about like what we do in zoos and aquariums, our two main pillars are welfare and conservation. But what we're learning from social scientists is that people aren't willing to listen to our conservation messages if they don't think we take great care of our animals. So that making them these two incredibly important pillars and really us needing to help carry the torch with these social scientists to help people understand that importance of welfare and clarity and transparency and taking people on these journeys so that they do understand what our animals are experiencing, what our expertise brings to the forefront. Um, and it, I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes in the future. And for, for Nick, in terms of how people are already teaming up with social scientists, there is a new uh, scientific advisory group within AZA in uh, North America and, and a few other places around the world. The, uh, they are the Social Science Research and Evaluation Scientific Advisory Group. So they are, are pretty active and I expect that we'll be seeing a lot more from them. So that's exciting to kind of think about. That is absolutely gorgeous. And you know, if we can do that, I've got this sense and here's me going completely into my, my arts mind that being an actor and a performer and having had a long tradition in the theatre, there is for me that also sense that when you come through the gate of a zoo, you're entering a certain context, as you would when you travel into a theatre. And please, if my argument here is not making sense, or there's a flaw in it, or if, there's a, if my case has got something that you, you want to add to it, I really want it, because I'm just working on this concept, is that... The, the, the actions are broadly similar to coming into a theatre, that you're choosing to actually go to that place where you pay to go in, that you then enter into experiences. And I think constantly about the idea of all the world is a stage. And I think that Shakespeare was at that moment identifying really clearly that what is the stage? It's just an antecedent setup. It's a place where action unfolds. And by being really clear about what kind of action you can expect and that tone setting at that moment, and if you can pair that with what you so crucially pointed out just then and so beautifully said, is that people don't listen to conservation messages if we don't take great care of our animals. So as far as a tone setting event is concerned, that's exactly the motivation that I've been tinkering with in the theatrical context with this animal training, this bird training show that we've been doing to try and say that the 
great care and the animal agency and the engagement with sentience at that moment is the thing that we are showcasing that we we want people to see that they are seekers amongst a planet of seekers so that's the kind of concept that we've been tinkering with as far as the tone setting event is concerned that's that's my best effort so far to do that yeah. and, and then to, to i'd love to know about this so, the social sciences um endeavor that's going on that you alluded to so betsy if you can send me a link to that and give me some more information mm -hmm. i'd be thrilled to take that investigative stream thank you yes that's wonderful and and it also made me think about um like these books when we were younger it was choose your own adventure yes right? so like are we going to set one stage or are we going to have different stages that different people can choose their own adventure even when they come into one space which is the zoo and and also um betsy to your point what i also remembered from you know hearing and and myself and from colleagues educators specifically this this message where people don't feel empowered so when they are you know these these are the threats to the animals in the environment or this is happening to them and then there's no nothing about what they can do that's also kind of a total shutdown because then people even some of my friends and family they say i don't know what to do so it's like i don't want to look at this it's too hard right so this finding some sort of empowerment and this is why uh, both of you talking also about you know museums and connecting to social sciences I remember going to the, uh, the humanity house which is in The Hague in the Netherlands and they have an exposition uh, experience where to, working together with um, refugees of you know creating some sort of Try, trying to experience what it's like to be a refugee and they take you through this this whole this whole house and and at the end you actually have an opportunity to speak with refugees uh, that are there that come to the house and talk about their experiences in in real life but at the end of the exposition and I could totally see that in zoos aquariums or anywhere else where you're trying to get people to act uh, and do something there are there were these computers and they have questions. They go, the first question is what type of activist are you? And then, you know, you can click on some answers and depending on what you answer, you get more questions. And at the end you get, you know, a whole bunch of things that you could do depending on what you chose. And you can send email it to yourself. I still have it. And I thought that was such a great, again, you know, when we're talking about empowering, you know, animals, of course, including the human animal with regards to our messages and acting on it. Uh, again, you know, a combination of social science and, and others uh, coming together. So those are some of the things that I've seen and heard. And that, um, that is brilliant. I really, I really like that. Thank you for mentioning that concept um, and kind of looping that back into how we work in welfare in zoos. I've had a discussion with our director where I would say like, okay, we're going to talk about this because people are, it's a hot topic that people are concerned about. And he said, okay, um, here's what I need from you. I need you to not just reiterate and give me the problem and the details about it. I need you to give me solutions, like help me know where to go so I can make that next step. And that was uh, inviting just to be allowed and empowered to make that next step where we don't always feel like we can. So it, I think it kind of reiterates that we need to do that in every aspect of what we do in, in zoos and behavior. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna add, uh, so Zuza, you were talking about people's experience with uh, welfare or their perception of welfare as well. Um, there's a number, so that's part of where the visitor experience side of things started. Uh, is Finley and Maple back in the 80s. Um, again, I'm going to provide a whole bunch of, because I am I keep mentioning so many uh, dang references, and I normally would not have this much of a memory for references if I wasn't working on uh, I, two different papers right now about the visitor experience, um, one that I'm an advising author on and another one that I'm, I'm uh, authoring, first authoring, um, but because I've written quite a a bit in this field. So um, so Finley and Maple looked at just the experience of, of the exhibit itself. So what did the exhibit look like and how that affected 
people as well. This is one of the first visitor experience real studies done in a zoo uh, to show that people had uh, better or 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 uh, uh, better experiences with and better perceptions of welfare, even of the animals, um, based on how naturalistic the exhibit was. So that the exhibit presentation itself has an effect. Um, this is part of what, um, so Lance Miller uh, did a study and uh, uh, Andrea Godinez, who is my graduate student, um, both of us published our studies right around 2012, 2013 on experiences people have when they see animals engaging in stereotypies. Um, we looked at a whole bunch of different behaviors as well. And that definitely changes people's, per so what people see animals doing changes their, their, their perception as well. Um, and Samantha Chu is, has since looked at a couple studies with little penguins as well. So um, again, I'll provide tons of references here, but there's a lot of stuff happening with, um, uh, I keep arguing that we need more understanding of the visitor experience from uh, uh, an empirical sense. Um, and I, I hope to be doing some of that work, uh, as Nick's already alluded to, that we'll be doing potentially some of that in Adelaide. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but uh, I also thought it might be, this might be a good segue, not the best segue, but an okay segue, um, to move on from uh, animal visitor interactions to get more into the, the welfare experience of the animals, both the, the science and practice, as well as what's happening with the animal experience in terms of uh, enrichment and training and training as a potential enrichment tool. So these are couple other points because I know people have commented a little bit here or there about that so I'm gonna kind of open the, the floor there moving on and talking about the welfare of animals more directly we spent so much time talking about visitors we did and that's our that's our common problem in welfare is that we're fascinated with animals but we get bungled up by all of these human factors and it's it's very distracting because it's fascinating and we don't know yet but building, I think your segue is great because if we think about how, how visitors perceive enclosures, can we pair that type of paper up with how animals experience that if you're looking at naturalistic versus unnaturalistic enclosures? We don't have a ton of, of money thrown around. So we like to make enrichment out of um, cereal boxes we've used, out of loo roll, all the different things that are free and easily available. It looks like trash to visitors, but do animals care? is the question that we should be pairing with all of this. And then how do we change that narrative so people focus on how the animals are perceiving it rather than what they're perceiving. And how do we do that in the hot second when people aren't reading signs? It's a hot 100 degree day in DC and people right. are just trying to maneuver through crowds. It's a tough ask, it's a big one. Yeah, you know, I, I was gonna mention, uh, not to segue back, but just for a second, uh, because you, you were mentioning about how people perceive this versus the animal perceives this. We also know so little because there is some there there is some research on on visitors. You know, Moss Jensen um, have looked at there's a, they have a few studies looking at the experience of the visitors in terms of where their conservation action matches up with their conservation education. We often assume that what they learn at the zoo is the most important component for their their later action. Um, and that doesn't always necessarily match up. I'm always curious about where, whether the opposite occurs. So just because people don't, uh, uh, we often assess their knowledge of these, of welfare of animals. So I'm still, you know, I want to tie this into the welfare of animals based on how they respond to survey questions or the importance of conservation. But whether or not they, they learn something do they visit the zoo and then because we have some data that shows that people do engage in more conservation action just based on visiting um, zoos so uh, uh, Andrea Godinez and I reviewed some of that in our, uh, information and in, uh, Godinez and Fernandez 2019 so we talked a little bit about that but that's important as well um, and that leads into the welfare experience because we often assume you know talking about Finley and Maple, naturalistic experience of animals uh, uh, or the naturalistic experience based on how people perceive that. 
what is the welfare experience for the animals, regardless of whether, as Betsy mentioned, there's not a lot of money to throw around and we often avoid using um, unnatural, uh, 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 unnatural looking enrichment or things like that, that the animal prob maybe, we don't know, this is it's an empirical question, how does that affect the animal? Um, but these all tie together so that the, how do we know what we're doing affects the animal in ways that are similar or different from how it's affecting the visitor's experience. You know, it may be good for the welfare of the animals and good for the welfare of the visitor. And we can't assume these, these things. These are empirical questions. So I often wonder about that as well, the, the, the natural versus unnatural enrichment. And we go, well, we can't let the visitors see that. Yep. But can we educate the visitors about that? And should can we focus more on the welfare experience from that enrichment or the training experience? Because we use that as an excuse to say, well, we don't want to show the the we don't want to uh, show this training of these behaviors that are necessarily uh, unnatural or shouldn't. You, you know, how much does the visitor learn from showing training, which may have an enriching effect in and of itself, if we do that for the public? rather than behind the scenes. So, which helps incorporate Sabrina's 24 seven concept there because now the public is being more informed about the back of the house stuff. All right, I just threw out a whole lot of stuff. That was like a giant, I, I just uh, excreted everything in my brain at once. So I'm gonna shut up again. I, I left Nick and Sabrina speechless. I think that's is there a, is that there was a thread, lot of is there stuff a thread that, you'd like us to pick up. Right. I just threw out like like the literally everything that was in my brain at once that I was writing down little notes of. I tried to like let me say all these things and give some context, but we should probably be more specific about let's focus on the 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 welfare uh component of you know how are we how are we tying the science to the practice and what are we doing to improve the welfare of the animals in this experience uh, in for, sorry, the animal experience and uh, how are we tying that together with the visitor experience? So I'll leave it at that. I'm distracted. I'm distracted. Oh, go ahead, Sabrina. Yeah, I think, uh, or what are you distracted about? It's always nice. When no, you know. oh, sorry. Well, in thinking about that, and that made me think of like, how, would, how do we measure um, uh, what is right for animals? And we often lean on preference testing. And so then I'm looking at back at one of the com comments about choice and mm -hmm. thinking yeah. about, you know, preference is great. You know, I've been working from home, fortunately, for a long time, and I've been eating a lot more cake. Is that a good choice for me? It's my preference, but it's not necessarily the right thing for me. Um, so that's what I'm distracted by now, and I'm thinking about choice, but um, carry on. Now I've distracted everyone else by that. Does that mean, does that mean you're thinking about cake, cake right now? <laughs> um, no, but yeah, now I am, because I've said it. <laughs> and now everyone else is too, so you're welcome. <laughs> I, I will throw an aside here because I see some mentions of looking at as a physiological welfare measure, uh, lifespan, longevity um, in animals. Um, the common metric used, if we're going to talk about as a physiological measure, is life ex is uh, life expectancy. So that's that's a lot more. There, we've run into some yeah. problems with elephants um, about that, about looking at. Mm -hmm. um, lifespan or uh, 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 life uh, longevity instead of looking at life expectancy. So that's really relevant. I won't get into how those, those are calculated differently, but it's an interesting dilemma in and of itself. But they so, both sound really long for an elephant. So yeah. how can we get at those smaller differences and identify important change that we're making? Yeah. So it's, it, I, I, I will say this, when we talk as a physiological measure of welfare, so life expectancy, um, and it, it is, is an interesting measure because it obviously it, it's a really important measure um, in terms of if animals had lowered life expectancies, considerably lowered life expectancies, that would be a huge flag, right? 
under some under some setting compared to another setting we would say well this is they live to be uh, or their life expectancy is this out here is x in the wild and it's it's shortened somehow under these conditions uh, which was what uh, started a lot of these multi-institutional elephant studies is because we, there were studies showing, starting with Club and Mason, showing that there was decreased uh, uh, longevity of elephants in captivity. Um, they were uh, uh, critiqued for that and they readjusted that for life expectancy and still showed, particularly for Asian elephants, lowered life expectancy. Since that time, uh, Greco, Carl Steed, Mellon, a few other people have been involved in a ton of multi-institutional elephant studies. But I don't find life expectancy to be that uh, interesting in and of itself as a welfare measure because it doesn't get at the kind of things that Malore at all talk about uh, or Malore talks about with the five domains as opposed to five freedoms and talking about a life worth living. So just because you live a long time or you have higher life expectancy, what is that life like? And that's what I think is most interesting for uh, looking at the welfare of animals not just, hey, look, you know, well, we put them in this setting and they live a really long time. Okay, but are, how are we measuring the life worth living during that time? It's, it's that an interesting uh, bias, isn't it, that we tend to think of ourselves that a life that is long is in some way a worthwhile thing, that the quantity of life over the quality of life seems to be if we're talking perception and there's a lot of comments in the thread about our perceptions that would have to be then one of the perceptions i think the human animal has is that a long life is indeed a, a marker of success and that may well have us traveling into spaces of, of philosophy very rarefied spaces about um, concerns over our own mortality we had just looking at is it I hope I'm saying this correctly. Is it Casey or Case? I'm just going to say Casey. That the grey seals and the longevity, that's really interesting to me, was we had flamingos at Adelaide Zoo. We no longer do. And just to put you in the picture for our region, there are no flamingos in Australia at the moment uh, because uh, the last ones that were held by Adelaide Zoo have died in the last few years. But one of them was over 80 years old. And we recently had a hippo that died at 53. And inevitably, what happened in the, the PR um, speak, I see, all right, you have a photo of our oldest flamingo. Yeah, amazing bird. Uh, is that the, the PR folk had absolutely the best time saying, directly relating that those flamingos' longevity was directly related to the level of care that they received uh, from their keepers and the hippo as well. And that may well, well, may well be the case. But I love the point that's being made that it's actually not the life itself, but what happens in it. That's the place of our interest. It's the place that we should be examining that stuff. And, and indeed, there may well be examples of many animals living a long time who are living suboptimal existences when it comes to the full range of choice and control that we would as a standard measure and going off of the mellow model of the domains apply to that situation. So just be, yeah, I, I think just because it lives a long time, I think that the flamingos that we had at the zoo did have fairly enriched existence, um, but it was still highly restricted by the fact that for a species that as far as its ethogram is concerned is an obligately highly social animal. By the time you got to the last bird standing, there was not much of that fundamental interaction going on anymore. And so very often we had comments from people about the bird being lonely. And that proved to be a really hard space to manage and interpret. So there's lots of things that just come with that as you move forward that think those, those questions more about, well, what was that bird doing as an individual and how did we help it explore its domain in a way that matched its 
its restrictions as an aged animal as well due to its sight impairment and all that sort of stuff. That was of much more interest to people. And indeed, setting up the bird to be able to travel towards signals where there was enrichment and there was interesting food available and all of those sorts of... Oh, did we, did Nick freeze? Nick, you froze for a second if you can still hear us. Um... I'll, I'll add on to what he's saying until he comes back. So I, I, I appreciate those, those concepts and thinking about what is it that an animal is experiencing and thinking about our five domains. And one area where I would like to see us learn more and have more conversations is with our pathologists. Uh, at the Smithsonian, we're very fortunate to have a pathology team. We're learning so much from the necropsies that they perform, but there's this massive disconnect between what we can see and what we can measure um, through behavior, through even our uh, um, amazing medical practices. And how does that, how can we fill that gap between then what we'll find out with how arthritic an animal might have been? and things that animals are so good at hiding, even from their closest caretakers. How yeah. can we bridge those gaps to create better benchmarks when we're thinking about our welfare assessments and what means something good and what is something we should pay a little bit more attention to? And those are conversations that I don't know where they'll go. It's uh, exciting. I was gonna jump in real yeah, quick. And, I know it's Rina. I'll go for it. Yeah, I was just going to jump in real quick and say, and I wanted you to make this comment and then we can use this, but Betsy just made a perfect segue. Um, so that's part of why, um, So, I, but I want to let you make this comment because the segue is we're talking about animals uh, in, in this sense um, uh, and, and talking about, uh, you, you know, pathology and the necropsies and showing um, ailments that animals may have been hiding. Um, that really uh, argues for one of the reasons why training as of it itself, so using training procedures can be such an important component of welfare assessment and also as potential enrichment because the training procedures often as going back to Hal Markowitz's work back in the 70s was showing that even just providing these devices that he was using to enrich uh, a serval ended up showing, you know, oh, here's a potential injury this animal was hiding that we would not have seen if we didn't tr uh, start training this serval to try to leap for things. Um, so anyway, but Sabrina, you had another comment before we get into some aspect of training, and we're still waiting for Nick to come back. <laughs> Yes, hopefully Nick comes back. Yeah, let's see, I had to think about, we had, um, we ran two um, seminars in 2016-17 on caring for aging uh, wild animals in zoos and aquariums. And one of our speakers in the uh, seminar in, the, in, in Germany was Dr. Andrew Kitchener from mm. um, the Edinburgh, yeah. yeah. Um, Museum and he a lot of his work revolving around looking at bones and you know and veterinarians paying attention to that with regards to like you said arthritis and other you know ailments that animals might be hiding and therefore a lot of the veterinarians moving to the calculation of the life expectancy of an animal and taking 75% of that to be kind of a flag in the system to start, you know, preventive care of scanning, of x-rays, of, you know, potential ailments. So, so it's so interesting to see how, you know, people paying attention to, you know, people studying bones in museums and publications that he has done with, for example, Graham Law and others, um, you know, that how that then entered the zoo world or veterinarians in general to come up with some sort of framework to, you know, do more preventive care for the animals that are aging because we're getting better and better at caring for animals in our facilities. So uh, that's a, uh, and then another thing there that I thought was interesting, Eddie, when you're talking about training. So at the, at the seminar that we had in, in Germany, uh, Dr. Heather Bacon actually, I think it was Dr. Heather Bacon, she talked about a case that she had with a polar bear. And so it was actually not in training, but it was with a feature in his environment 
where um, there was like a, um, a waterfall coming down and the animals sitting a lot of times under the waterfall and keepers started to kind of pay attention to the person's kind of play and interaction. And then, you know, you're kind of looking more and more and realizing the animals sitting in a certain position. It's always on the same side of the face. And then they did this intervention to see what if anything was wrong and there was actually a problem in the jaw with the teeth and the gum. And as soon as that was taken care of, you know, the animals wasn't under, but it was kind of like an anesthesia and just sitting under that, uh, under that um, water feature, right? So the importance of behaviors observations in general, uh, but like you say, it could be training, it could be something the animals are doing, but it could also be an, an enrichment or something else where you go, or when the animal, right, when you're training, you may be watching, are they always chewing on one side versus the other, or, right, there's all these little details to kind of get insights of what they might be experiencing or they have pain or whatever else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's those challenge, those extra challenging ones where just modern medicine still can't even see some of these concepts and like some of our really huge animals and it's just that mind meld that's um, we'll we'll get there. I'm, I know we will. It's just gonna. It's hard to. It's hard to. Oh, I think yeah. my coworker might be joining us. <laughs> oh, I just saw. Oh, I, I, just saw I, I, I Yeah, we got Nick back, which yeah. is great. By yeah. the way, I I, I love this this topic and I can't believe we waited so long in this conversation to get here because I, I absolutely love this topic. It's so important and part of, uh, and Betsy, I don't spend enough time, I spend almost no time thinking about that in terms of uh, uh, how uh, learning from the vets and other individuals at the zoo about uh, physiological features um, physiological aspects can help uh, guide what we should be looking at behaviorally and trying to improve both measure, so both the science and the practice of welfare. Um, so that's really important. And Sabrina's getting at some, you know, just delivering enrichment itself, um, changing behavior in some way, attempting to change behavior, whether directly through training or through enrichment and allowing that to assess um, not just the behavioral, but the physiological welfare of the animal is important. Um, and uh, I don't think we spend enough time talking about the importance of training. Um, that- Actually, I'm gonna jump, quickly jump in here because yeah. I saw uh, somewhere in the chat, somebody mentioned personality. And, um, and I think, you know, when we're talking about physiology, personality, all those things, just from the sheer, you know, research in, in the human animal domain, you know, people have different ratings when it comes to pain or when it comes to dealing with things or, you know, their, their affective state, what bothers them or not. And, you know, just that variety, um, you know, in other animals, it's, it's mind boggling, right? To, to try and get a grasp for that. But also that thing, again, um, tying it in there, the, the personality of animals. Yeah, we have so many personality studies looking into um, the work I've done on models for chimp introductions or comparing it to longevity. I wonder if we compare that to morbidity and mortality, if we can add in information about how keepers think they process that that's harder to get to but how keepers think that they handled it that would be fascinating a lot of work but fascinating yeah hi training and enrichment <laughs> i now i know we have a we have a fifth uh, uh co-host here yeah, mm -hmm. so. she just finished her second nap of the afternoon <laughs> oh that's uh, living my uh, my <laughs> ideal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing but food and naps. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, Case, I think it's interesting when you talk about the game addiction, and and actually, I, um, you know, I don't, I don't, and there was somebody else also talking about maybe it was Case again about the seeking behavior, or maybe. Um, in the shows, so this this why yeah. are animals looking at us, right? Why are they seeking us? And I think you know you you mentioned this beautiful uh, at the beginning, Nick, about this change, right? When they're looking for you, and um, 
And, and again, there, you know, for us to step back and go, okay, so for example, me coming from a marine mammal background and may, mainly learning through my career doing that, how much, especially in the beginning, we were talking about 30 years ago when I started, uh, so much of it being, you know, everything is contingent, right, upon correct behavior and all the food almost comes from the trainer's hand. So, you know, that they are looking for me, that they're seeking me out, uh, you know, has various reasons that, and this is why I'm so interested in that marine mammal space to work with, you know, and I'm really glad that like Eddie and I are working with trainers in, in different countries to, ex to explore this area of, you know, something that, that Jim McBain, former veterinarian from SeaWorld once said to me, he's like, you know, if they had all the food, if all the gates were open, if so, and so on and so, are they still going to seek us out because they think it's so fun to hang out with us. And, you know, it's not because you're the source of my food, right? Because I've got the key to the fridge. Uh, and, you know, and, and, you know, I often talk with trainers about the fact that of course, we're, we're, when we're training this whole, it's not like when animals are, if say I call an animal over and, I, and they don't want to come over, I could go, okay, that's great. You know, here's, here's all your fish, uh, see you later. Uh, because you chose, you chose, right? I asked, you said, no, uh, why would I, not say, hey, that's great, here's your fish anyway, that's your choice, right? Uh, and that kind of seems very kind of strange, but I think it's such an important space for us to navigate in because we have such power over food, right? Um, and so we need to be extremely sensitive to what that means. And so, and I'm gonna stop uh, talking right here. I think there's also, uh, I think the majority of animals work in that capacity where they are, focused on the food and that's their world. But we've, I'm sure we've all worked with animals who have been reinforced by touch and interaction. And sometimes that can be eating even more meaningful than food. So it feels like it's their primary reinforcer rather than a secondary reinforcer. And um, I don't know, that's just what popped into my head. So that's all I have to contribute <laughs> in that moment. Yeah. We, we have a lot yeah, I, of- I agree to that, sorry. But... Uh, we have a, we there's a I mean this is something the the field of applied behavior analysis has spent so much time looking at contingencies of reinforcement and talking about different aspects including with preference assessments and I've I've published a couple of our uh, past preference assessment studies Sabrina has already alluded to um, you know we're doing uh, some preference assessment studies with dolphins and sea lions with a few facilities. Um, and try and looking at other aspects of, of that. Um, but so not just identifying edible versus non-edible and looking at other potential reinforcers, how those affect uh, uh, behavior and interact with reinforcement contingencies because we definitely can go far beyond just, hey, do, did I, you know, did I click and treat uh, with food or am I using access to something else as the potential, uh, as the reward, as the potential reinforcer? Am I using interaction with the keeper as a potential reward? And how am I assessing those potential reinforcers? So there's all kinds of really cool stuff there. But um, part of that, I mean, a big push that I would love to see as we start be having more public awareness of all this training that we're doing behind the scenes, take that to the front of the house, show that kind of training on exhibit, because there's some of that training that we can be using to get the animals to do the things we want, like interacting with their enrichment items. Uh, you know, I, I, that was a paper I, I, I published just a couple years ago about using training to increase enrichment interactions, which has been otherwise almost completely not talked about. Uh, why, why aren't we doing more of that? Why aren't we, get, why aren't we using uh, behavior analytic principles, reinforcement procedures to get animals to do more of what we want them to do on exhibit and then using that as an education tool for the public? Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's really great to see that many zoos and aquariums, but also 
other facilities with animals have moved to such programs and including, you know, something that is really dear to my heart, which is training for research. You know, we have every two, three years, we have a research training uh, seminar with a whole bunch of people who just train animals for all kinds of research questions. And uh, I always use the Marine Science Center in Rostock in Germany. Uh, that's, that's the only thing they do, right? They do husbandry, they're caring for the animals, and they do awesome research with sea lions and seals and octopus and, you know, birds. And, um, and people pay. People pay to go in and that's what they'll see. So, and it's just wonderful. Um, you know, they see vision and they see cognition and they see all kinds of really, you know, diving physiology and people love it. And, and I think that is such a powerful tool to show, and it ties to, like when I was working with harbor porpoises in, in Kerdemina in Denmark, we would, you know, train the animals, of course, also for husbandry, but also for research. And, that, and we would use it in our communication. You know, we would talk about echolocation and we would talk about the bycatch problems of harbor porpoises in the Baltic. So it's such a powerful tool um, to use training for so many different, you know, reasons. And I think there's so many great examples uh, Nausicaa in, in France with their sea lions, they have, you know, trained them shape discrimination and they get the sea lions to dive down to the glass and the kids are holding the shape and they talk about sea lion cognition and all kinds of stuff. So I think it's absolutely yeah. brilliant and so glad so many are using it more and more in all kinds of activities. Yeah, I saw it beautifully modeled at uh, Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. Some years ago, I was on a visit there and it was as simple as a snow leopard just demonstrating a leap onto a large square that had been made out of the flattened fire hose plaited together. And it, it had obviously been stuffed on the inside and then suspended from the ceiling of its home area. And the, the behaviour on cue from the animal's carer who was just positioned at the outside, saw the animal travel up and put itself in the position to do this fantastic leap onto this device. I just demonstrated so much about animal skill. And for me, my take is just how, it's like a visual vox pops of what the response is in the human animal group around it at that moment. And so for me, the, the, the visual and the oral experience of the people's response and the, that, that level of engagement just by watching response from them at that moment was a beautiful piece of trained behaviour. It certainly put the animal in a position of using all of its skills and it had a positive outcome and it was all on show. I thought that was a really superb piece of training as enrichment, but also as a moment of crossing the species bridge into help, helping people see the animal's capacity, appreciating its grace and beauty, and being impressed with the dynamism of the experience. So very worthwhile on a number of fronts. <laughs> Great, thanks for the censorship there. I'm appreciating it. <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting to also hear people's different uh, opinions, right, and feelings around these things. Like some people would say, that's absolutely fantastic. You can see whether it's pets rule the show with, you know, presentation with mainly dogs and rabbits and, and rats and all doing things they are amazing at. Um, and then, you know, on the other end, people going, well, how is that different from a circus, right? I mean, you're getting them to jump from from one place to another thing. It's, it's so interesting to even have these various conversations because that's kind of how we have framed it, right? How we think it, this, is, this is also the right way, the, the respectful way, the dignity a respecting way of showing the animals, yep. um, sh showing the animals, right? And which is kind of already kind of a like, here you are kind of right. thing. Um, yeah, I think these are really interesting, important discussions to have because even with our best intentions, people will still think this is not acceptable. 
um, for various reasons and not necessarily in the rights domain, but just from a, even from an agency perspective, the, like, well, they should just be able to go about that. And that's, I think, often an argument that's made from how zoos differ from good sanctuaries. I, I'm not saying whether I agree or not, but this thing that in a true sanctuary, if a zoo would be a true sanctuary or in a true sanctuary, you could do whatever you want. You, you don't have to jump on queue uh, and so on and so on, right? So I think, yeah, it's just something I had to think about. That's yeah, I, I wonder about that sometimes because then is that, especially if there's a transition from doing things or like we've opened up this cognitive box and then suddenly you take it away. Like if you have um, like moving into a sanctuary and I think there are many, many, many wonderful concepts within that of retiring an animal, but do they miss that? Do they miss any element of it? And maybe it's not that whole entire package. Maybe it's just the attention portion of it, or maybe it is the cognitive challenge, but I don't think we know that answer to those things. And so no. could I put to you in, in this context then, and I really loved that Sabrina raised the point that, you know, some perceptions might actually see, say that interaction that I talked about with the snow leopard as being circus-like. If you are going to interpret that to the visitor and try and explore a way to set that up as being not like a circus, then what would you say? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, just like, you know, we often get questions or we get sayings, arguments about get them out of the zoo, put them in the sanctuary, right? I mean, we could have a whole virtual debate just on that topic. Um, and, and I think from, you know, experiences from our, um, from people who have worked with elephants in free contact, going to protected contact, mm. um, killer whales in shows, having stopped shows from one day to the next with people in the water, all those stories to me uh, and the, the behaviors described by uh, the people working with these animals indicated that you know they were uh, missing, not all, probably all of it, but at least a lot of things that they had before. And, uh, but what does that yeah, then mean? Is that uh, if you could also, especially if we're talking about not such a nice um, situations that it could actually be a, a step forward, right? So, uh, but I would say that like in my mind, having animals engage in behaviors that they are amazing at, their, their capabilities, sensory systems and talking about that uh, makes sense in my mind, but I think I can understand why it doesn't in other people. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think this is, this is where it's so important, right? When you're going to start a, some sort of debate or argument, what is your starting point? Because you're, you're probably never going to get anywhere near or come to, okay, so where do we agree, right? I think that to me, that's always most important to see. Okay, so where do we overlap? Where do we have common ground rather than, because I mean, we'll just never you know, get anywhere close. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to throw in my two cents here because I do have strong feelings about this. And my strong feelings are largely about the fact that my and, and many of our opinions should matter far less. <laughs> and we should stop making assumptions about what is happening with the visitor and instead treat them as empirical questions. So we make all these assumptions. Well, if the visitors see this training session on exhibit, where they're going to assume that you know this is unnatural and they're going to take away, they're not going to learn as much about conservation. They're going to treat this like a circus. These are all assumptions that we're making that are empirical questions. And so much of the time, when we've bothered to actually take the data, it turns out that what the visitor is learning from that event is very different than what we assumed that they were experiencing or learning. So we need to, so much of the time, I mean, we've changed so much of how we've exhibited animals based on opinion alone. And when those could be guided by data, turns out, um, you know, public feedings, for instance, are now starting to become 
more common again. Although depending on what facility you go to, people will say, nope, nope, you cannot do that public feeding. You can't do, you can't do it there. You know, these are things, and, and it really is facility dependent and geographically dependent. Well, there was research going back to the 70s, uh, von Kuhlen Kromhout showing that bears that were involved in public feedings engaged in less stereotypic activity across the board in European facilities. And we said, yeah, 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 but it's a bad perception. So we need to get rid of that. So zoos went into the effort of saying, no public feeding, stop it. And now it's starting to come back because we're starting to recognize some of the uh, potential, but again, a more opinion driven than it is data driven, what, how this can improve, uh, how it can function as enrichment and improve the visitor experience. So my strong uh, feeling about this is just that we need to, we need to start relying more on data about what is actually happening rather than saying, yeah, but we're ruining the conservation message. Again, that's an empirical question. We can't assume. I, I will go with you on, on many of these points, but I still, there's still many, many people, you know, even if you have the best naturalistic setting and so on, they will just say it's, it's a non done. And so, you know, right. um, I, so I think, you know, obviously you make great points with regards to the, um, you know, that people might have very different perceptions. We, we can't, but we know there's a very large body of people that will just never go with it. And I think also on the other end that I have, because I've had lifelong interest in research, and I just mentioned the Marine Science Center in Germany, you know, I cannot tell you how many bosses have told me in the past, you know, people don't want to see research. People don't want to see, you know, this boring stuff. And that's not true. You know, when and I was, and, you know, there's so many questions from the public about the animals and their abilities and all this stuff. And often, at least when I was working with marine mammals, you know, we would, you, we would do stuff that didn't make any sense in my head. And, and so also in our field, I say, there's a lot of people that say, visitors are not gonna be interested in this because it's gonna be boring. Uh, but that is all about how, well, the tone setting and the theater that, that Nick has talked about throughout, right? So um, yeah, that's, well, that's my two cents here. But people believe these things because at some level, they believe their opinions matter more than data. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I mean, uh, we've seen that in the U.S. through and through. Right, right. We, <laughs> we, we need to stop the animals' well-being. Okay. Right, right, right. But these yeah, are but all, I mean, all empirical questions. But these are all mm -hmm. empirical questions. So if we're going to say, but we can't do that because it affects the conservation message, that's an opinion, and it is not an empirically based opinion. We need data to determine whether that opinion has any validity or not. So that's what I have the strong feeling about is stop relying on the assumptions, treat them as empirical questions and stop believing your opinions matter more than data. And we're, we're, letting, we're letting policy be guided by opinions because, you know, hey, this person is su you know, super important or this person runs this, this this uh, 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 this facility or makes these determinations, it, uh, authority does not trump data. Mm -hmm. Oh no, agreed, agreed, yeah. And with that, let's think about how can we move forward and make that happen. We're in a situation now where if you're working in a zoo, you feel very lucky to still have a job right now. So if right. we don't have these these resources to to even keep our folks employed, thinking about in, incorporating a whole new, well deserved branch into our repertoire, it seems impossible. It seems like such a really big ask right now. How can we team up with universities, who are also struggling in their own um, genre? Uh, how can we how can we make this happen? because we have to, we're trying to open up as fast as we can if we're not currently open. We have to make these decisions now. I'm sure that a lot of our 
leaders would be very welcome to have that data, but in terms of their motivations and who they are beholden to and the picture view that they're looking at now, that's not one of them. That's not the house that's burning right now, even though it is in the big picture. Yeah. yeah, How do we get that to be prioritized and who can we team up with and bring in to make it happen? No, that. That, that's really that's really important. But so I, I was just going to say, uh, and thank you for grounding me that way, Betsy, because I don't want to make it sound like this is I'm making it overly simplistic mm-hmm. that the argument is just data versus versus opinion, um, and there are uh, so many factors involved. It's multifaceted. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I do want to stress, and that's what I still have a strong opinion about. Mm-hmm in that my opinion on having this strong opinion should be less relevant than the data. So even that is an empirical question, right? How much- oh, should It's very have? meta now. <laughs> yeah, I just made it way meta. Um, but but the, the, I think many of the decisions that we make still at the end of the day, you know, we can say, okay, I know that there are a lot of factors going into this. I know that, but why do we not have data helping guide this. So. Similar for animal welfare. And I think this discussion is both from the inside of our community, if you like, zoos, aquariums and so on, and on the outside uh, that are, you know, maybe not interested or don't uh, agree with, you know, zoos and aquariums. So there's just so many different fields there. But see that in and of itself too can be easily, that's part of why I say we need more data on this topic is because in many cases, the people that are coming at zoos and aquariums that are avidly anti-zoo, anti-aquarium, um, you know, anti-captivity of any sort of sense, um, in some cases, anti-pet. So if we're gonna take the most extreme animal rights position on this, um, those people are doing this from a purely opinion-based, non-data position, almost always. So I know I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of you know uh, black and white kind of statements here, but I, I so often I see what uh, animal rights activists or people arguing against the existence of zoos are doing, and they're they're demanding that their uh, that that their opinion in the absence of any data is heard. And I think what's an effective way to combat that message is, okay, that's, so you're saying uh, this show is detrimental to the welfare of these cetaceans. That's one hypothesis. How about we measure that? Yeah, but people will say because of the capacities and capabilities or agency or similarities to human, you know, um, it, it's therefore that we should not be hold them captive and so on. It's not because of a lack of data. It's also because of what we know that this is that this is true for people. I think. Yeah, I I think we we need to get better about both using and talking about data and talking about our our you know when we have our welfare successes that we've measured. We need to be better at being able to convey that message. I just, I find that, um, I mean, it, it's a really tricky topic. How do you deal with an emotionally charged argument, right, in this sense? And I don't necessarily want to say that that's what we're trying to do, but um, what I am saying is the more that we can show these things empirically, the more that we can show our successes with data and then turn around and also say, and we are changing what we're doing because we're listening to the data rather than opinion. I think that goes a long way because we're, we're not, at the end of the day, if we're engaged in that debate, if we're talking about you know turning it into this simple dichotomy of, well, it's either pro-zoo or anti-zoo, and you're already kind of losing if you're at that level in that debate with that, that overly simplistic dichotomy. But if you are, you're not really trying to convince the animal rights activists that they're, what they're arguing in their anti-zoo argument is wrong. You are talking to the people that are listening to you to having that discussion, uh, whether directly or indirectly. And I think people 
are can we need to people can be smart enough to sit there and go well is there data to support this argument again i mean betsy made an, a, a very important point here which is that there are in some cases entire uh, uh countries um that betsy and i happen to be in where people um uh will ignore data um over opinion over very important from in from uh, all spectrums uh, from all spectrums it happens yeah but yeah. But I do also, think. Let's step also back to that. We have to be very careful by saying that because we have data, that we are right for holding this particular stance. Uh, I think sure. you know, even if we have data to support that, that, that I don't know. I'm just saying, dolphins are doing well in shows and in captivity and all that stuff. It still doesn't make it. So true that therefore that stance is true for everyone. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I noticed Bob's point there. Who are the real decision makers deciding what people see and what they don't see? And I think there's such an important conversation to be had with our zoo leaders and, and leadership in zoos at the moment. And I can speak from my own experience with the organization that I'm interacting with is that the whole COVID climate has made ledger reckoning budgets even more crucial than they were before. And so the zoo that I work with is a not-for-profit conservation charity. And heading into that space during this time has been a really full-on thing and so often is, is the case in moments like this, there's a triage approach. What are we going to do at this moment? We have to keep ourselves afloat. So lots of responses occur in that space and not all of them are about necessarily the sorts of things that we're discussing right now because survival just as an organization, as a business becomes key. And one of the things that happens in that space is with the restrictions around, therefore the brief animal encounter and the behind the scenes experiences that we've had. Um, when we are now able to, and we are in a very fortunate position here in South Australia to have very, very low uh, COVID um, content in our community at the moment. And we are able to start exploring more within the frameworks that we've had to adopt those opportunities to interact. This might be the moment then that we can test some of the confirmation bias that all parties carry with the data investigation that Eduardo's suggesting. But I think so often the leadership has to be interested in the research and the science in chasing after resolving these issues by getting these data sets. And that's one of my roles and one of the constant communications that I'm having with our leadership is how can we bring in helpers to assist us to do that, to show us the truth about our operations, the truth as far as we can empirically determine. So that question from Bomb is who are the real decision makers deciding what people see and what they don't see um, is very often about our ability as advocates to get our leaders to join us in that space away from some of the survival distractions as, as a business operation and get them to commit to those sorts of conversations and those kinds of investigations. And how cool is that if through that process, we can reset that tone of engagement for the people who come to join us in that space as well, to showcase our research, to even enlist them into that process as well. So I think... One of the projects we're looking at, Eddie, with some of our parrots will give us some scope for that, I'm hoping. So I'm looking so forward to exploring that space with you. I'm very inspired by the generosity of the contributions from Sabrina and Betsy today as well. No, this is fantastic. I mean, these are the kind of conversations. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I was just going to, I'll just say really quickly. No, these are the kind of conversations that I think are really important because it does put a frame of reference for where does science become relevant in making these decisions? Where does the data become relevant? And obviously I have some pretty strong feelings 
the irony of bringing some emotion into a, a, a demand for science to be involved in this conversation, <laughs> to be at the table. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like every, uh, 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 I'm like the, the stereotype Star Trek debate, you know, of being uh, uh, Bones and Spock in the same, you know, at the same <laughs> time right there. Um, but uh uh, nonetheless, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up. So I think this is really great. I'm really I'm really grateful for uh, uh, all of you being here and, and us having this conversation. So and I keep interrupting Sabrina as she's about to say something. So no, that's all good. I was uh, going to say something similar to you and also um, talk about how you know it is in those differences also that we it. It's almost, I think again, maybe stepping back in the space of when, when is something true? Why should it have to be this way versus other ways of navigating spaces? And, and data is one thing in it and emotion is in, in thing and you can have you know, data collected on emotions or thoughts, but I think you know, it will be just like we will have, it's very difficult to find common ground if you're in this stance versus that stance. I think within our community, there's such a range that it would be extremely interesting to see how do we even move to some, if, if what is the common ground between facilities that say no artificial enrichment is their philosophy, even if you have data to show that it doesn't impair the conservation message, it's it's good for animal welfare, they'll stay, still say, I don't care about that data because that doesn't fit with how I think, you know, animals should be showcased or whatever you want to call it, right? So, and it's kind of, it, one of the things I guess we need to try in our community is see where do we come together that we can agree on, um, regardless of on our philosophy or our stance with regards to and, and we're, of course, we're, we're talking about, you know, accredited zoos versus unaccredited zoos and, you know, all these other things that come into play. Right. But yeah, it's a big space. It's very big. What? And That's... I think oftentimes we wait, we wait for administration changes to happen in zoo leadership when there are those really big non-negotiables about like, I will not have non-natural enrichment like that. You're right. Like that's not a movable place most of the time. Yeah, so we wait for the next leader to come in. And is that the right move? No. Yeah, that's part of what I was, I was alluding to. And I, you know, again, I have some strong feelings in this sense too, um, alluding to about, you know, when authority trumps data um, and authority trumps, uh, you know, like, so regard opinion trumps data. And the idea that no matter, you know, my opinion is, is unmovable, uh, that you will see sometimes happen and that it's, I don't, you could bring all the data under the sun and it's not going to change the opinion that you are not going to, uh, there will be no training of animals on exhibit. There will be none, you know, I, this is, this is not part of my philosophy. Um, so and I don't know what the answer, I mean, if I had the answer to that, I'd be amazingly successful. Um, uh, <laughs> in, in, more than you already are right now. In, in, wow. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I'd be more, I'd be more successful. Uh, I, I can at least say this much. I'd be more successful than I, I by I, I, my own light years beyond anything, any of the small accomplishments I've managed so far. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's, that's, I think, it, how do we talk to, you know, do we, how do we shape that behavior? How do we work on approximations towards getting to that point? I certainly don't think I do an effective job of it. Uh, some of the time where I come into the room and I say, you know, well, your opinion doesn't matter as much as data. That's going to end an argument uh, in that I'm going to be shown the door pretty quickly. Um, so uh, that's not an effective way to, to, to do that. So I don't know what the answer um, is. I know when I do it badly. <laughs> and it makes me think also about conservation, you know, just the field of conservation is as divided 
as is our community with regards to you know running zoos and aquariums and what we will or will not do and uh, and i'm talking about you know wildlife conservation it's just yeah. as complex with regards to you know even the discussion say in the netherlands right we have this kind of rule about if you haven't been a citizen of the of the Netherlands for the last ninety years, you are you are seen as an invasive species, and there's all kinds of you know different debates. Why ninety years? And who is to decide now that the climate is changing and birds are not flying as far south? They just land in the Netherlands instead because it's nice and warm there. Uh, who is to choose there, right? And there's all these debates just on. Are we going to kill these birds? Are they going to be allowed to stay here? And uh, so it's so interesting that, you know, I think you could take any, any profession, any field where we'll have the full range of beautiful human emotions and thoughts and philosophies and everything else. And that's yeah. reflected a bit in the chat where people are talking about audience data. And, yeah. and reaching out. And I know that in the US, there's the prime group, the I say Moray, I'm not sure how they say it, group, uh, who do survey zoos. Some zoos have QR codes where you can take surveys now that we don't have touch things. Um, but but I think what's interesting is what which questions are they asking? Mm -hmm. And especially mm -hmm. when you have a nationwide survey, is that the questions that are going to be meaningful to your zoo? So it's an interesting kind of balance in there to incorporate all of these different perspectives. And I also want to say, I realize that we're kind of out of time, but I've been really enjoying watching the daylight change because we're in four different time zones right now for the, the speakers. Yeah. <laughs> Nick came to us in the dark. Yeah. yeah, he was in the dark. Now it's getting dark here. As, as we're wrapping up, I'm going to say uh, uh, real quick, because we are getting to that point of wrapping up. And, and again, thank you all of, you know, Betsy, Sabrina. Uh, Nick and everybody attending here. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, I was going to say, and it, it, Bob Bailey mentioned something that's really important here, um, which is a component we uh, we haven't talked about enough. And this is part of, you know, understanding who your audience is that you're talking to. If it's the board members, if it's the CEO, often, um, uh, and especially when we're talking about nonprofit or not for profit. Uh, the those financial incentives, you know, what's keeping the zoo open? It may not, you know, we can we can posit that as profit, but profit in this sense, uh, particularly for nonprofits, not for profits, which many, in fact, most zoos are, profit might mean literally just keeping the lights on. So it's that much more important for the the CEO for the board. They're thinking money, financial. What do we do here? And so if we can tie our data um, when we're talking about data towards, and this is why it's generating more revenue for your facility by doing this, you know, visitors form larger groups, they stay longer, and that means more money. There's more money going in, you know, they're, they're supporting more conservation efforts at the zoo so it's more money getting dropped here. There's almost no, in fact, I, I don't know of any study offhand that has looked at that aspect. Um, and it's something we're, uh, I should say, uh, by the way, nobody in this chat steal this idea, um, but <laughs> it's getting written into a paper right now, right? Um, no, it's, we're, we're talking a little bit about, I'm joking about that, by the way, please talk as much. Our collective paper. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, everyone in the chat is now an author. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, no, it's it's something we're talking about a little bit, and actually, I, I hope more people talk about it um, in in publications wherever else. Is that that's part of knowing your audience and talking about that. So, um, uh, incorporating the financial aspect into that, I think, is a great way to start shaping uh, some of how we get the people in charge into the changes we're proposing. So, you know, if you show the visitor a training demonstration on exhibit, they learn more, they support more conservation, and they hang out longer. And that means they've bought more stuff at the zoo in terms of meals, et cetera, et cetera. And we can show that. Wow. And then we go into the rabbit hole of unsustainable souvenirs, unsustainable food. <laughs> it's just right here. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a that's another virtual behavior chat. Yeah. That is right. an absolutely we can get into uh, we can get into that. But so all of that. So uh, we just made this at least at some level, even though I'm not always the biggest fan of the word. We made this holistic at some level because we just talked about everything here being affected and how we get people on board. But and Sabrina brings in another component. But that said, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot here. This is uh, uh, this has been amazing. This is awesome. So I'm I'm gonna shut up. I've already talked way more than I said I was gonna talk um, because there's there's uh, uh, Betsy, Nick, and Sabrina are all wonderful. Um, so, but I'm glad everybody spent a, a, quite a lot of time talking. So this has been fantastic. Thank you again, everybody, all the attendees everyone interacting in the chat, as well as uh, Betsy, Nick, and Sabrina. Yeah, the chat was great. Really, really great, great, great stuff there. What uh, closing, thank you. closing statements does everybody have? Betsy, Nick, and Sabrina. Oh. Closing um, statements? Oh, dear. Well, my closing statement will have to be that sometimes I think emotions they gets a bit of a bad rap. Um, I think there's uh, lots of beauty um, information, lots of science data, and certainly our connect, we talked about being connected and feeling connected, hope, all these things change is so much tied to how we feel. And so let's make sure to have emotions as you know big of a driver and part of all of this as anything else. And, um, and so, using the word emotion definitely in many positive ways and that it's not necessarily a bad thing to be yeah. emotional or to speak from emotion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is there a jury or what is this closing statement about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that works that that was perfect sabrina Excellent. I'm going to think about um, a position that we're often in, in leading from the side where we are not in charge of something. And my closing thought is thinking about how not everyone is a decision maker, but everyone's opinion is important and how we couch the information that we provide, the, these, these data that we collect is um, crucially important to our negotiations and making sure our opinion is heard. So uh, best of luck to all of us as we go on that journey. And keep talking about it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Betsy. Perfect. I think I think for me, one of the things that I consider, and I talk about with the diverse ranges of people that I encounter in this privileged position is, when we talk about welfare, if we look to ethology, we often see there's a strong case for nature not being a welfare agency. There's lots of extreme difficulty that wild organisms deal with all the time. But what I see over and over again, both in my avid bird watching endeavors and in my observations of people at the local parks with their animals and in the zoo context and in the plains of the Serengeti is that behavior does indeed orient towards outcomes that are in the interest of the operator, that I see organisms operating in such a way that they, they improve access to reinforcers. They keep them on the high and they keep punishers on the down low as much as possible. And I think there's an interesting passageway for us there. That if we can get everybody's lives in this interactive space in the rarefied, curious cultural construct that is a zoo or a safari park, that we can get all of our organisms operating in such a way that we can support the urge to keep reinforcers high and punishers low, that we're doing a good thing in that space. And that's a piece of welfare worthwhileness, because for me, it sits beautifully with what we are all doing, and that is seeking to operate in our own interests to keep reinforcers high. And so when we look at the conversations that we're having with our zoo leaders, one of my acknowledgements is, what's your reinforcer and how can I help you attain that? So if we can choose these pathways where we are sufficiently open and we have our views, but we're not so attached to any of them that we block the next 
amazing potential that may drive us forward. That is the space that I would like to avidly occupy. So I'm looking forward to staying engaged with all of you as we continue to stay open and sufficiently attached to our convictions, but also open to having them influenced by data and whatever other means drive us meaningfully forward. Perfect. See, there's a reason why you got you got to be the last person to say anything here, Nick, and I'm not gonna ruin it by saying anything more other than thank you everybody again. Um, that was really, that was perfect, so. Thank you, everybody. We'll, uh, thank you, everybody. We'll be ending the recording now, and thank, thank you again.